Thank you all for coming to the Triangle Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Kevin Jaffe, and I'll be introducing our speaker, Dr. Raj Raj Kumar. Uh, I've had the, the privilege of knowing Raj for, for quite a long time, and we were actually uh, reminiscing a little bit at dinner last night and decided that we weren't going to put any dates on <laughs> anything here because it's, it's, it's really been quite, quite a long time. But suffice to say, it goes well back into the previous uh, millennia. <laughs> so, so Raj, over this time, has had a distinguished career as, as a systems researcher. He's, he's known for uh, much substantive work that he's done in operating systems. If you've ever played with the, the mock OS or the real-time mock OS, that was all Raj's work. Uh, going up from there into multimedia uh, systems, multimedia computing and networking, uh, into sensor networks, and all the while having a strong uh, real-time system bend to his research, including uh, a fascinating tie-in to the Mars uh, rover. And I encourage you to look at his webpage to see all the details of how, how it is that Raj and the Mars rover uh, in, intersect. And uh, currently, he's applying his trade in a relatively new area of computing that's, uh, you know, many of us here, called cyber physical systems. And he's going to give us his take on the field. So without further ado, I give you Raj Kumar from Carnegie Mellon. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, right in. Here's a quick outline of the talk I want to give you today. I'll give you kind of a very high-level overview of uh, what I want to talk about. Then I'll uh, split my talk into kind of uh, three segments. Uh, the first segment will be controlling your, the world, the physical world that uh, we live in from anywhere. Second will be uh, smart eyes. And third will be autonomous uh, mobile devices. And then I'll quickly summarize. Uh, so this will be kind of a forward-looking talk for the most part. I'll try to give you some techniques, if you will, a little bit, a little bit of uh, technical nuggets we found along the way. But the idea is to basically be forward-looking, look ahead of uh, what is feasible. Okay. So I guess if you are not uh, exposed to this uh, term, cyber-physical systems, uh, cyber-physical system is one which integrates the cyber aspects of computing and communications with the monitoring and control of physical entities in the world that we live in. Right? And you need to basically do this integration, manipulation, and control in a very dependable fashion because lives and property may depend on it, uh, safety, security, efficiency, and in real time to kind of expose my real time bias, if you will. Uh, and the long term goal, I guess, uh, the way we see it is that I guess uh, this is actually part of a community initiative that uh, a group of us over the past almost uh, four or five years now have tried to actually launch on a national scale. Uh, the whole initiative kind of bore fruit uh, last year when the National Science Foundation launched uh, a new program called Cyber Physical Systems at about uh, $30 million a year. Uh, thanks to the new stimulus funds, I believe it was about roughly $40, $45 million uh, last year. And the expectation is that this program will continue for the next uh, uh, four years, for a total of five years. Uh, and meanwhile, other federal agencies are also interested. These include uh, the Department of Transportation, Department of Energy, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, DOD to some extent. Uh, so I think uh, we hope that over time there will be a lot more interest in uh, advancing both the research and applications in the domain of cyber physical systems. Uh, and secondly, uh, the term is beginning to catch on across the world as well. Uh, many Europeans in the embedded real-time systems domains uh, are becoming more sympathetic, sympathetic to the term. And I've had discussions with uh, people in uh, Japan, uh, people in Korea, and so on, including funding agencies. So the term is catching on. So as I actually uh, describe, for example, this definition right on this page, I can see people from different communities reacting the following way. Right? If you are, for example, uh, an embedded systems person, you'll say, that is embedded systems. Cyber physical systems is nothing but embedded systems. And if you're actually working on wireless sense networks, you would say, hey, this is what I do. Okay? And if you basically have somebody in robotics, you'll be jumping up and down, this is nothing but robotics. Right? So depending upon where you are from, you can identify with this right away. And people with uh, pervasive computing, ubiquitous computing, ha, exactly my vision. What are you talking about? Right? So, so the, I guess the, uh, the net uh, summary is that every statement that made by, made by each of these community members is correct. Right? So it's basically so the, the term cyber physical systems is meant to be a superset, a union of all these domains. Right? The goal is basically have researchers from each of these relatively independent, isolated silos to come together, form a larger audience, and then also 
place greater emphasis on the physical side have engineers from different disciplines come together as well. Right? So that's basically the goal. So, so if you think this is exactly what your domain is about, I'm in sync with you. Right? It also means that we need to bring more people, more researchers to the domain. And if we do that, we can actually transform, kind of bring about a new revolution, if you will. We all believe, ought to believe that the internet, right, which actually had very humble beginnings, right, basically launched the internet revolution, which kind of completely transformed how as we as a society, how we as people communicate with each other across national borders. It also transformed how we actually uh, buy things, how the marketplace has been transformed thanks to e-commerce. Right? So that uh, transformation happened thanks to the cyber aspects of the internet. What we would like to see happen, I guess, in the coming years and decades is the notion of cyber physical systems transform how we as humans, as members of our global society, interact with the physical environment that we live in. Right? That, that's the goal. So I guess in uh, some... Uh, a uh, profound sense, I guess we want to be able to transcend space, yet control the physical environment. So if you're if you into tele-robotics, tele-operations, you would sync up with that right away as well. Right? So add that, uh, your community to the list of communities that we want, I guess, kind of include in the, into the family. So I guess the goal of the initiative that, I guess, we uh, kind of a group wanted to launch was uh, create a new science of cyber physical systems, if you will. Uh, I guess it's kind of at the bottom here is to basically try start to build uh, some scientific foundations and corresponding technologies which will actually integrate the cyber concepts of computing communications with the dynamics of physical and engineer systems which must basically satisfy the rules, the laws of physics. And it turns out that uh, if you integrate uh, the smarts that uh, software and cyber uh, components can bring to the table, now basically apply that to the uh, physical, uh, uh, physical world, a whole bunch of sectors actually can be, uh, can be uh, impacted. These include uh, transportation, be it automobiles, uh, aerospace, uh, trains, and maritime uh, ships and such. Uh, you can look at it in terms of uh, civil infrastructure uh, all around us. Uh, it turns out that the infrastructure in the U.S. in particular is in bad shape. Right? Lots of investments really need to go in. People actually say we need to be spending anywhere between one and uh, two trillion dollars to basically get it up to par. Uh, many of them have been aging for quite some time. Uh, these include uh, bridges, the water system, the sewer system, uh, agriculture, uh, industrial plants. Uh, of course, we talk about the smart grid. Some uh, reasonable investments are going in uh, and highway infrastructure. Right? And the next is health healthcare, and basically delivering uh, high quality uh, health care. Uh, you can think in terms of smart hospitals, uh, ORs, operating rooms. Uh, I guess if you go to a modern operating room, it's very scary, not because of the condition that the patient is in, but actually the condition, the connectivity or lack thereof between the equipment in the, in the <coughs> OR. Okay? A simple human error actually can cost the life of the patient. Okay? There is no interlocking between devices and so on. It may be the case that this equipment and that equipment should not be on together at the same time. If the nurse or the doctor forgets, bad things happen. Right? The same goes with drugs, of course. Uh, and then, so telemedicine, I'll talk about, uh, and imagine basically monitors, uh, I'll uh, touch uh, base on that in detail as well. Manufacturing and the military. I'm going to skip, uh, I call it, these are my rules of uh, military engagement, but I'm going to skip those. Okay. So uh, as part of the discussions that happened, uh, we had uh, held several workshops, actually the first one which actually happened in 2003, and then we had uh, general workshops on cyber physical systems, specific sectors including automotive, then transportation, SCADA systems, supervisory control and data acquisition used in uh, electric utilities uh, and uh, plants and the like. And the list actually keeps going, uh, keeps going on. We have had uh, workshops held by the Department of Homeland Security, for example, look at the security of cyber physical systems. So as part of those discussions, uh, we had identified as a group a list of uh, grand challenges to basically motivate, the, hopefully, this new and emerging community to basically towards some grand goals. Uh, this is something for us to keep in mind. I guess the medical community, the medical research community, for example, looks at the cure for cancer as a long-term goal. That's kind of the holy grail. Right? So even if they do not find a cure for cancer, and they have not found a cure for cancer despite all the investment being made, they have been successful in basically extending the lives of people with cancer. So that in itself basically is a, is a good benefit, but you still want to have that goal of finding a cure for cancer. Right? So similarly, I guess we want to set ourselves some long-term goals. So here are some. So the first one is basically to deal with uh, traffic fatalities. 
uh, there are about uh, roughly between 40,000 and 45,000 people die in the US every year. More than a million people die globally every year thanks to uh, uh, automotive accidents. And actually, if you count the number of uh, injuries, right, so they are not actually uh, deaths, but in terms of injuries, we are actually talking about several million, tens of million across the globe. Okay? So if we can embed intelligence, right, software into these uh, mobile platforms that we actually drive in, can that software be, uh, uh, be agile, be aware, be alert all the time? not be subject to the distractions that humans can actually get into. So maybe actually we can bring this to zero, right? The number of deaths, number of injuries over time. We may never get there, but that's not the point, right? As long as the curve is asymptotic heading towards zero, we would have made a big difference. And you can actually map that to, I guess, reducing traffic congestion and delays as well. The second, I guess, is in terms of uh, black code free electricity generation distribution. I should really generalize it uh, to the uh, smart grid. The idea is that because uh, the uh, electric grid is an aggregation of multiple domains operated by different administrative entities. The fact that uh, one segment goes down, you do not want the entire network to go down. Right? So basically this has ha happened in the past where uh, a breakdown, for example, in Ohio actually propagates all the way to Canada. We have had uh, uh, blackouts, uh, brownouts uh, in the Northeast and in the past. We have had this disaster in California, I guess, a few years back uh, when Enron was involved and so on. Right? The question is, can we actually build these large scale distributed entities where failure in one part does not propagate to other parts of the system and brings the whole system down. And then, so I guess uh, this is a hot topic these days as well. We had come up with these grand challenges before it was kind of the fashion du jour. Uh, the idea basically is that the buildings are aware of the energy consumption that they are doing and they kind of react and adapt themselves to basically reducing energy consumption. Right? As a simple example, for example, uh, you, you might see that in many conference rooms, people actually have a meeting like this, and then they leave, and the projector is still on. Right? The room should be able to actually recognize there's nobody in the room, this projector is on, should turn that off. That's a simple example. Right? And of course, you can come up with a lot more complex examples, and I guess the net goal would be basically actually to come up with uh, buildings that consume zero net energy. Right? And that's really building in smarts along with basically monitoring and controlling the building environment. Uh, so this is another favorite of mine. Uh, think in terms of basically maybe devices that you, care, that you carry, uh, could be smartphones in the future, but cooperating with actually entities in the environment, right? both at work and at home, that kind of keeps track of your activities, your needs, your preferences, and then basically guide you. Right? So anybody out here who actually has had a good secretary understands the value of a good secretary, <laughs> right? They know, they know that you screw up all the time and they kind of have a backup plan and they kind of step in, rescue you, you look good, but they are the ones who did the work, right? Now, and I guess the same goes for our spouse. A very supportive spouse goes a long, long, long way. Now imagine basically a device person infrastructure that basically acts as a, a very good secretary and a very good spouse. <laughs> Okay? Wouldn't that be great, right? And of course, you can take that map to, I guess, uh, not just busy people like ourselves, but older people and disabled people to improve their quality of living. The next is basically, I guess, uh, world-class medicine. I guess I don't need to speak to the choir here. You basically have some very uh, impressive uh, research facilities right here for basically tele-surgery, uh, tele-operations, and so on. So the idea is basically, can we scale this to basically, independent of wherever you are, you are able to get access to world-class medicine, right? Generation zero would be basically just having a telecon with uh, a doctor who is somewhere else, right? For say from rural America to actually urban America, but then you're able to cross national boundaries beyond that. And eventually you know, the doctor needs to be able to kind of feel and touch you just like a normal doctor would, even though you're actually far away. And then of course will come uh, telesurgery and so on, which of course the military will find very immediate applications to. So that would be, again, a, a classical cyber physical. The list goes on in terms of uh, getting uh, high yield agriculture, losing, uh, using very little uh, moisture, uh, building and testing large systems, like, for example, uh, the new uh, Dreamliner from uh, Boeing or Airbus A380, where each time they build a new plane like that, they are literally betting the company on the success of the plane. If the plane fails, the business is done. Right? Why do we have that? Because it's actually a cyber physical system problem that they deal with. We really do not have the tools, the environment, the languages, the abstractions, the systems building blocks actually get them done right very quickly. 
And if you mess up, you go back and just go fix it, do one more iteration, and you're not endangering the health of the company, which in turn is a big component of the nation's economy. Right? And I guess you can think in terms of, for example, bridges. Uh, for example, the Minneapolis bridge uh, fell down, and it's being replaced with a very nice bridge with some state-of-the-art facilities built in. Imagine, basically, similarly, critical infrastructural uh, components out there. Right? Could be water, could be sewer, could be bridges, uh, uh, could be chemical plants and the like. They basically understand their role, and if anything basically violates their operational constraints, they can basically say something is wrong. Right? And they basically warn you before really something really, really bad goes on. Right? So they call for primitive maintenance and correction. And lastly, I guess I talked about general classes of applications, kind of uh, communal uh, holy grails, if you will. But if you want to build a custom system for your specific needs, you still be able to, should be, still be able to build those one-off systems fairly quickly, thanks to the techniques, the science, the underlying principles, and the engineering and the technology that's made available to you, thanks to advances in CPS. So yeah, I guess uh, right, so that's kind of uh, the uh, vision that we would like to see happen over the years. Uh, in terms of technical challenges, to just give you a feel, I already mentioned this, uh, we would really like to see an all-encompassing science of doing cyber-physical systems. Right? If you are a roboticist, you kind of have your own foundations of robotics. Right? If you are a wireless sensor networks person, you basically have the uh, techniques and algorithms that you use out there. Right? Embedded systems, of course, they have their own uh, real-time scheduling schemes and so on. Right? The question is, can we actually bring these things together where basically the, uh, the, the two aspects of cyber and physical can be dealt with as a single comprehensive science? Right? I guess uh, not to take the analogy too far, if the physicists can talk about a unifying theory, why can't we, CS and engineers, talk about our own notion of basically having a unifying science? Uh, so one, to me, I guess so one, component, one comment that always comes up is when you deal with the physical world, how do you deal with all the crap that happens? Right? Uncertainties happen all the time. Right? I'm basically just walking down, I stumble and fall down. Right? I'm driving back, I've been driven that same road for the past 20 years, I have an accident. Right? So things are unpredictable. And what do we do? How do we deal with that? Right? We buy insurance. Right? So the question is, how do you model and deal with uncertainty? Right? So I guess the closest analogy that I can give is basically, I guess, going back to, I guess, uh, the signal processing community. Right? Noise is pervasive across the universe, it turns out. But we actually, right, so we actually have electronics up and running. They are able to basically deal with the fact that uh, noise is present everywhere. Basically, the filters, we can kind of model noise, different sources of noise, and we kind of come up with techniques, uh, shielding, filtering, uh, right? and the like to basically come up with a solution. And then there are lots of mathematical models as well. Right? So the question is, can we come up with models of uncertainty that we can actually live with in these systems? And in case everything fails, there's some kind of an insurance, kind of a backup plan to actually go back to. And this is going to be big as well. So I, uh, the goal basically is that if I had uh, physical components with, which have to satisfy laws of physics and have uh, cyber aspects where I can simulate whatever I want to, whatever I can imagine, can I compose these things to actually come up with a coherent system that is useful? So how do I compose these components? Of course, I already mentioned this. Uh, components, even subsystems, or even systems can fail, but you do not want the entire system of systems to fail. You need to be dependable. Safety is going to be absolutely key. Otherwise, people will lose trust in these systems. Uh, you do not want, I guess, uh, uh, attacks on these systems that are successful. Uh, and then, of course, there are privacy issues that have to be dealt with. A lot of that has to be dealt with in real time as well. Uh, the other component is basically is that, for example, I'll be talking about autonomous vehicles towards the end of this talk. Right? It could be working correctly today, but tomorrow, the tires could have been worn out, my brake pads could have been worn out, but now suddenly the dynamics of the vehicle that was being controlled correctly before is no longer behaving correctly. Right? So somehow the physics of wear and tear needs to be built into the models and basically the question is how, how do you get, validate them, how do you test them. And then of course you might actually want to do automatic runtime optimizations of different kinds. You might actually want to have uh, model based design except that the models include not just your cyber components of uh, computing and communications but also actually the physical interfaces, the physical devices, the physical environment as well. And then so verification and validation of this is going to be a huge challenge for a, for a long, long time. So that's on the science side, if you will. On the engineering side, right, I guess uh, we need to actually have uh, standards, if you will, where you can basically have interfaces that are plug and play compatible all the way from the component level to the system level to systems of systems. Uh, we need to be able to actually be able to specialize these components, these interfaces to different sectors. Uh, I talked about a bunch. And then the question of actually do, can we build test beds that are actually scalable, uh, generalizable across, test, uh, across sectors or not. 
So clearly cost is going to be a big issue as well. So how do I actually bring down cost without actually trading off too much of dependability? Right? And then lastly, I guess uh, people also bring this up. I guess there is this uh, notion of uh, singularity, right? where basically once you actually embed uh, smarts into the environment, into the devices that are mobile and so on, suddenly these uh, uh, robots are uh, moving things, uh, become intelligent and they take over the world and uh, the humans become slaves. Right? Uh, so I guess uh, very I like the Terminator movies myself. Uh, I, I don't see the singularity happening okay, in the near future at least. Okay? So I'm not worried about that. Okay? But that said, I think there's a valid argument to make that, hey, you can actually have high-tech things go wrong, go bad, right? Jurassic Park, right? So things can go haywire, actually go uh, beyond, right? so uh, go out of control. So then basically, I guess, we as, uh, I guess, engineers uh, and scientists, we need to actually build in mechanisms where if things are actually going out of control, that exists reasonable means for basically for the human operators to take back control and shut down the systems in a safe way. Right? So that's actually built into the system as well. Right? So, so there are lots of bunch of challenges both on the scientific side and on the engineering side. So I guess, so, so I guess uh, now I'm talking about the three segments of the, remaining, uh, the remainder of the talk. Uh, I guess I'll talk about uh, transcending space, give you some feel for how we can actually actuate things even if you're physically not there and you will not be doing it yourself. And then basically uh, building in intelligence, if you will, uh, to actually act as eyes and ears everywhere uh, for both monitoring of anom anomalies and then uh, proactively respond to a situation when something goes bad. Because uh, you can uh, apply that uh, in safety <coughs> situations when disasters happen and so on. And I'll talk about uh, trying to improve the standards of living, greater comfort and convenience. Okay? So three segments. So let me talk about the first part. So kind of uh, early uh, uh, work on my part. Um, so just to give you some numbers, just look at uh, electricity consumption today. Right? So there are lights on, air conditioning on, the monitors on, projectors on. If you actually add up uh, all the electricity bills in the US, right? that's the residential segment, there's the uh, uh, commercial segment, if you will, your stores and your malls and your pizza shops, and then there's the industrial segment of uh, plants and factories manufacturing things. If you add up all those bills, it's about $350 billion per year. Okay. And you can actually go back and check your own surroundings uh, when you go back. You could easily conceive that 10 to 20% of the energy can be saved if you're just conscious enough that actually electricity is being wasted. Okay? And as a scientist or an engineer, you'll say, so it's very doable, right? And 10 to 20 percent can actually translate to actually big numbers. And if you actually just actually fast forward uh, just a few years from now, uh, lots of car makers are actually bringing in uh, uh, plug-in cars, right? So the plug-in cars actually can be, si be sinks. They're actually consuming energy from the grid, but they're also storage uh, elements as well. They could be pumping energy back into the grid when the grid needs energy as well. Right? So there's some very interesting uh, dynamics, uh, pricing solutions that need to be had there. Right? And the same thing actually now I uh, think about heating and cooling costs, whether it's gas heat or not. Right? So uh, and then you can look at uh, security. For example, I pay 25 bucks a month for security monitoring of the house, whatever that means. Right? I just pay the bill and then I guess uh, I presume that there's a benefit somewhere. And water usage, for example, it turns out that uh, uh, if you talk to the water distribution people that say that if they waste, only 40% of the, basically the water being distributed, they are very happy. So from the reservoir to the usage points, about 40% gets lost. They don't know where, it's only 40% you live with it. Okay. Um, and the same applies to gas consumption as well. So, so we actually do so many things in the uh, physical uh, domain. Uh, right? So I guess imagine that all these subsystems are actually connected, integrated in some grand physical internet of things, if you will, right? and then every Generation point and usage point is monitored and controlled. Okay, just uh, I guess in the average home there are about 50 microcontrollers. But basically, th imagine basically each uh, each faucet in your home, each plug point, each lighting fixture, and so on. Right, each gas usage point, add them all up. Right, we have the capability, if you will, to basically put in sensors for each of those points and actuators for each of those points. So I should be able to remotely monitor each of those points, measure actually what is being consumed, and basically put an intelligence on top saying that, hey, turn that off, dim it, lower the volume, increase the volume, I'm out of town, why is basically the, the gas oven on, right? Why is basically uh, water uh, spewing out, right? You should be able to control itself, right? So it transcends space and access me even if I'm not there, right? So, so we are literally talking about trillions of points. 
if not attention hundreds of tens or hundreds of billions of points, right? And then, so why not basically actually have this coordination happen on a regional scale or on a national scale, right? And then, so the point is that you are actually collecting literally real-time uh, periodic streams of data and then act upon them, right? So as uh, kind of uh, towards that, uh, we actually uh, built uh, uh, devices that actually operate in the sensor network that we have been building at uh, CMU and my group. Uh, so this device that you see on the right, the idea basically is that uh, you remove your appliance from the uh, socket, you plug this device into the socket, now you plug your appliance in there. Uh, and once you do that, this actually internally actually has a built-in wireless uh, radio interface. It also actually has a built-in relay and an ammeter, if you will. It measures the current and the voltage, and it can be remotely sent commands to basically turn things on, turn things off, or maybe even dim the voltage on it. Okay? So it can basically sense, control, communicate, and by itself, if the device is not on, consumes for a little power. Right? So imagine these devices basically getting smaller and being everywhere wherever electricity is being consumed. Right? All the way from the endpoints to basically intermediate points where you have the entry point to the house, to the building, to the subsystems, and so on. And now you basically have a network that you can actually control, read out, right? all that. So some internals of that. So I guess let me just, uh, uh, some very early studies that we have done. This was a lab that we instrumented at, uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, and this basically shows the uh, energy consumption profiles of different things. There's a desktop computer that is on all the time. There's a refrigerator that the grass students use, that the compressor kicks in, goes idle, kicks in. So the duty cycle gives you a feel for how efficient that refrigerator is, or how low or high the thermostat setting is. Right? And then you basically have a, a, a microwave kick in here, high wattage whenever it kicks in, and it turns out that there is something else, so this is the total energy, and there's a bunch of energy being consumed. We, at this point, do not know what device is actually consuming that energy. It's a building that like has 100 years old, something somewhere is consuming energy, we don't know. And if you look at the fraction, there's a big chunk. Okay? And that's what we did. So and this is just a, a zoom in on the top right here, uh, the refrigerator kicking in, the desktop computer, right? And at the left, we basically we said, because we also have sensors in the wireless node that we actually have inside that uh, gadget, we said let's sense motion in the lab. Okay? The gray vertical bars that you see there are times when it actually senses motion. All, all the time, there's no motion, there's nobody in the lab. And you know, grad students and you know professors, we just leave things on. It's not my responsibility. Right? And what you see basically is that energy is being wasted. So we put in basically very simple intelligence that basically said, if basically there's no motion for a, for a while, turn things off, and you basically see that uh, we can immediately drop energy. And just by doing this very stupid thing that anybody actually, even a non-technical person could, could say, we save about roughly 12% of the energy spent in the lab. Simple things go that far. And of course, uh, being the smart people that we are, we can come up with more and more and more complex solutions and basically get energy consumption done. Right? So these are basically kind of the low-hanging fruits that we as, uh, I guess, uh, technical people and as a society should be pursuing before we actually think about these grand schemes to actually come up with uh, uh, solutions for the energy problem. So here are some questions that we would like to actually uh, uh, deal with. Suppose I had lots of these sensors across a floor, across a building, and so on. I collect these uh, readings, right? The current voltage uh, on, off. What do they really mean? Right? You actually infer basically kind of the activity patterns of what is going on. Can we predict the dynamics of what will happen because I turn things off, does it mean that I have to turn them on right away? In which case, the transient energy consumes something. And if I am actually monitoring temperature, what does it say in terms of the uh, efficiency of heating or cooling the building? Is there a leakage, right? And then am I actually detecting leakage in the right places? Can I actually propose or uh, make recommendations of what needs to be fixed? Uh, and I, you can, uh, then you say, do I control something? How do I control it? When do I control it? Can I uh, provide as an, as an input parameter the budget limits for my electricity bill, my heating bill, and so on. Right? And then you can say, I guess, that that's the analytical side. And then you can step back and say, if I want to actually synthesize, how would I build a new building? How, where would I put my sensing points? Where would I put my control points in? Right? You can basically turn the problem around and design this, the building, if you, the structure, if you will, to make things easier for us. Right? And then can I state and prove some mathematical properties globally? Right? Under the uh, uh, assumption of uncertainty will always be there. Right? And lastly, for example, can peak consumption 
on say on a national basis or regional basis be accomplished. It turns out that the bulk of our electricity costs does not come from consumption, the average consumption. It's because of the peak consumption. So basically during, for example, summer at noon, all the ACs are running. Now the so peak consumption is very high. The electricity plants have to basically ramp up their production capacity to actually very high levels. And that is where the costs are. And if we basically everybody behaves the same way that, they, that we do, we need to be building newer and newer coal powered plants to satisfy the demand. If instead, if our sensing control infrastructure for these points are smart enough, we can actually tell some of these devices do not turn on. You can turn them on at a later time. That could be our cooking, could be our uh, dry wash, it could be our uh, dishwasher and so on. If we can postpone that, if we actually just bring down the peak, even if the average goes up, you will actually, the cost of electricity generation goes down, I believe, exponentially. Okay? So those are things that we need to, so we need to actually build the science up, right, using building physics and, and so on. Right? And of course, there are human factors, consumer factors that need to be kicked in, right? So basically, if the utility generator, the electricity generator is actually gaining, some of the savings need to be passed to the consumer. But if the utility, for example, is controlling devices in your home, we as uh, red-blooded Americans say, nobody tells me what to do, right? So that needs to be incentives in place as well, right? So it's a very interesting dynamic supply. So let me start again. So, so we have uh, built, uh, I guess, uh, the voltage control devices, what you see there. We have built uh, several generations of uh, sensor nodes. They basically, I guess, uh, is your standard uh, sensor network uh, platform that except that we built everything, including the hardware and the software stack, which I'll talk about. Uh, we have some nifty devices for our synchronizing time. We built some uh, smart camera nodes, which I'll talk about. We have some portable entities that can actually move around, that you can carry with you, uh, integrate into uh, things that you carry, for example, into your purse or into your uh, smartphone. So let me uh, talk a little bit about the stack inside. So I'm going down the stack if you want. Okay. So we actually built, uh, as Kevin mentioned, I'm, uh, my real background is in real-time systems. So we actually built an honest-to-God real multitasking real-time system running in these very low power, low bandwidth, uh, low computation power devices okay. uh, using uh, not just real-time scaling principles, uh, resource reservation, and so on. Okay. And you can actually go to nanoarcade.org to look at uh, some, of, some information. Okay. So now actually, uh, so we actually found an interesting uh, nugget which I did not expect to find, but actually we found that. So the microcontroller in these devices basically can operate in uh, one of three states. Okay. It can be an active state, right, in which case it consumes 30 milliwatts. It could be an idle state, which is in case it's actually uh, consuming 6 milliwatts. And in a sleep state, it consumes 5 microwatts. Right? But it turns out that if you go to a sleep state, it takes you 10 milliseconds to come out of idle sleep, of, of, of the sleep state. You save a lot of energy, but coming back, you pay a huge time penalty. And if you're actually in idle state, 6 milliwatts, you take only uh, 6 microseconds to come out of that state. Right? So here is this very interesting uh, trade-off that you have. Right? So it turns out, so then, so let's look at, for example, you have a multitasking real-time OS, the interface with multiple sensors, multiple actuators, each of which could be operating at uh, different rates. Right? So in which case uh, we can actually structure each segment of code as its own thread running at different rates. So which is what we real-time people do all the time. It's actually very natural to do here. So here on this uh, left side graph here, uh, you see that, for example, uh, tau1 comes in, executes at a certain rate. Uh, tau2, task tau2 comes in, executes at a different rate. Tau3 comes at a different rate. And then whenever the processor is idle, uh, you try to go to the idle uh, state. And then if the, quote unquote, the idle state is long enough, meaning it's greater than 10 milliseconds, you try to go into the sleep state, right? So what you see basically is that the processor is idle quite a bit. Sometimes you're in idle state, sometimes you're in sleep state, right? What you would really like to do is have all the non-active uh, states be in sleep state because you save the most energy, okay? So there was a question we were asking ourselves. It turns out that you are able to do it by just basically a very simple uh, tweak in the scheduling policy. This is what we did. So we actually came up with a scheme that we called RHS, uh, rate harmonized scheduling. Okay. So if you are just using normal, uh, sorry, if you are using just normal prior to scheduling, like uh, it's called rate monotonic in this case, which says that uh, a high frequency task has a high fixed priority and a higher priority task preempts a low priority. Right? This turns out to be kind of an optimal fixed priority scheduling policy. So that's what this would do. And you see what happens here. I have three tasks with some parameters, period of 10, period of 15, period of, I guess, 25 in this case. And you see that there's a bunch of idle slots and a bunch of sleep slots. That's what you end up with. 
And if you turn out, basically, if you have this rate harmonic scheduling, we say we actually impose an artificial period, which, for example, in this case will be equal to 10, which be, being the shortest period in the system of 10. And we say any time any task comes in, it is eligible to execute only at the boundaries of that artificial 10 millisecond period that we injected. Okay? When that guy kicks in, it says, hey, you guys are eligible to execute. Anybody who's ready to execute, executes. And once that uh, queue is done, you go to sleep. Next artificial boundary kicks in, that's when you look at. Meanwhile, if anybody uh, comes in the periodic rate, they just have to wait until the artificial guy comes in, the rate harmonizer comes in. Okay? So basically what it does is that it batches executions uh, to, uh, to some periodic pattern. And then it turns out, now we can, we can do an energy saving version of that. On top of that artificial period, we inject a task which has an execution time of C sleep, which is the 10 millisecond on the previous law. Okay? And we give this the highest priority. So each time it comes in, it will sleep for 10 milliseconds. It forces the sleep. And then anybody who's ready to execute can execute. Right? And they're actually, as I said before, they get batched together in a consecutive sequence. Right? What it happens, well, how long it happens, at some point the process will become idle. When it becomes idle, you put the process to sleep. Whenever there's nothing to do, put it to sleep, and it turns out that this sleep duration will actually be consecutive to the next arrival of that sleeping block. So that will basically be a, uh, be a longer sleeping block at this time. So what happens is that every inactive duration automatically becomes a, sl a, sl a deep sleep time. Okay? And of course, you have to say, how do I make sure that things are scheduled? You work out the math, there are some constraints like a, uh, the total utilization cannot be greater than 50%, and you have to satisfy this condition. Basically, we pick the, uh, uh, the shortest period to be the period of the, uh, of the sleep, so this condition has to be satisfied. And actually, if you look at this number here, it says the total utilization of task set should be less than 50%, and for a sensor network, that's plenty. We are talking about 1% or 2% duty cycle, no big deal. The end result is that, so it's a very simple scheme. We already have a periodic scheduling scheme in place, into the C sleep slab, so with our, you're done. Smart, very simple energy energy, right? So I guess this is an illustration of, hey, once you start thinking differently, some nifty schemes come to play, right? So, so our goal is that if we, each one of us basically marches towards the uh, uh, grand challenges that we talked about, we'll come up with these technical nuggets, and over time there's an encyclopedia, a handbook of these things, and future generations keep on benefiting and build on top of that. Okay. And so not to say, test the scalability, actually we, we built a campus-wide uh, sensor network called Sensor Andrew. Uh, that's basically at this point we have, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep move uh, forward uh, very quickly. We have about uh, 300 nodes installed across uh, five buildings, a total of 1,500 sensing points. I guess uh, we have proposals out to basically buy 6,000 nodes so that we can uh, populate the entire campus of Carnegie Mellon, including the Toms and so on. Right? So we would, we would like to do basically not just sensing, but actuation as well as, as I talked about. So we also actually interface with a bunch of other devices which can actually measure electricity consumption in bulk across the entire floor, across the entire building, across the campus, and so on. So we actually collect uh, and validate aggregate information as well. And we actually built a multi-tiered architecture, a three-tiered architecture, and uh, I guess uh, strictly speaking, it really can be decomposed into multiple uh, agents talking to multiple servers. So we actually build uh, different applications to do, for example, uh, monitoring mobile devices, registration, notification, uh, domain-specific data handling, viewing, and so on. And then, we, of course, we have uh, protocols inside. And then we use some standard messaging formats. Uh, we use actually XMPP, which is Extensible Messaging and Presence Protocol, the same protocol that's actually used by Google Talk, their IM, as well as Twitter, right, which is all the rage today. Uh, so it, it actually can scale uh, literally across millions, uh, tens of millions of uh, endpoints using a published subscribe model. So we, we can do that. And so this is kind of the packaging that we use to deploy things in different battery segments. Uh, the old computer science hall, uh, the engineering hall where we actually do localization demos. Uh, this is where we actually do our development where my students sit. Uh, so we have some uh, extra hardware for debugging purposes before we deploy it. Uh, we kind of uh, uh, high level view of our campus. You can drill in, log in and then look, for, for example, at a floor, and then look at where the nodes are located. You can right-click, get some attributes of the, of the devices in there, and then you can get the historical information about uh, uh, sensor data collected, and uh, you can also turn on, turn off devices right from this interface. You're seeing an older interface. 
So imagine this on a global scale. So, so I think it's definitely doable, and the underlying protocol get you there already very, very, very nicely. Um, so a second segment of the car, car of the, so the first one basically talks about embed intelligence into the environment, which remotely we can sit there and control, observe, and then put in policies that execute autonomously, if you will, to satisfy the goals that we set. Right? So this one is about uh, the following. Right? So I guess the simplest example I can give you is uh, imagine, I guess, uh, so go back a few years when uh, London had this terrorist attack. Right? And uh, it took them, basically, Scotland had to basically a couple of days to basically go back, look at all the video data that they were continuously recording on all the subways, and then do manual tracking of where did the explosion happen, who got in, scaled back to other cameras, and then eventually, I guess, they basically went, uh, they, uh, kind of went to the, where the uh, terrorists actually live. And by the time you go there, lots of accomplices have left, right? presumably. Right? So the idea basically here is that can we build smarts into these camera sensors or audio sensors where it's actually doing local processing in real time, extracting information in real time, saying that I saw a person with the following attributes. I saw a car with the following attributes. right? And that information is actually sent back to wherever the centralized archive is. Right? And meanwhile, video clips around that even are also being sent. You're not sending random stupid data all the time, just basically uh, uh, inundating the archive with lots and lots of useless information, right? And you can all timestamp and so on. And so, for example, if an event like this were to happen, all that you need is go back and basically invoke your local version of Google and say, tell me who was in this environment at this point in time. Can you map back to basically where those individuals were of those group of individuals? Could be 20 people, could be 30 people, and you get all those 30 things. And then the humans look at it and say, ha, this is the person I'm interested in. You basically, if you can basically find that in 15, 20 minutes, you go to the neighborhood that they were living in, all set. Right? So the idea is to basically be able to have intelligence processing in real time as opposed to basically post-processing humans in the loop, laborious processes. Right? So it so happens, for example, you go to your ATM, there's a camera uh, taping your transaction. Okay? If something happens to you, you lose, for example, somebody mugged you, uh, stole $200 from your account, you go and complain to the bank, they'll very likely say, here is your 200 bucks, go away. It costs a lot more to, for them to actually go back and actually process the video. Okay? Pretty dumb. Right? So we need to be able to extract exactly what is going on. And they say, oh, at this point in time is when the transaction happened. Show me the video of the person. You should be able to correlate with the database and basically nail somebody down very quickly. Right? So actually, we have built a couple of versions of the card. This is actually a, a processor with a, a 60 megahertz uh, processor. We have, uh, and we actually can interface with that wireless sensor device that we have. So you can actually deploy it in places where you have electricity, but the wireless networking, the wired networking need not be in place. And then we have a more advanced version of that with uh, a 600 megahertz digital signal processor. And this has both uh, Wi-Fi as well as uh, uh, wired ethernet. And the idea is that you will mount it on, for example, uh, electricity poles in a parking lot. It's monitoring information when it sees cars go and come out late at night, any movement, basically, right, just actually tagged. So basically, video clips uh, are associated with those tags. So you Google for those, you search for those tags, and the corresponding videos show up, and they actually can correlate it from one camera to the other camera. We have the basic infrastructure being built uh, very far from where we need to be. Uh, so here's an example of uh, two cameras sitting in front of our uh, office building there, uh, also collecting sensor information on, on the left. And here's a quick, uh, very basic capability where we are pointing a camera at this, uh, and then when a person uh, walks in, it's just motion detected, highlights the person. Well understood vision algorithms that we have will go a long, long, long way. Right? So here is the idea basically is that the sensor and the processor are integrated locally with the memory, and it's processing right there. So it's actually a, a, a classical distributed architecture in that sense, and you're not inundating the network with, with, with useless information. Okay. So that's basically, uh, so to me, uh, you can apply it to basically scenarios where people can get caught and then uh, uh, die in uh, actually horrible deaths. So at least we have deployed uh, this in the environments like that. So I guess in the few minutes that I have left, uh, let me uh, cover the uh, third segment, which is uh, trying to improve standards of living. Uh, I guess the idea, I guess uh, this is a vision that is very close to my heart, is building uh, vehicles that we ride in that do not crash. Right? And the idea is to basically make uh, autonomous mobile platforms real. Okay. I've already uh, mentioned a bunch of these things. We actually lose a lot of people, a million, more than a million people die every year. Turns out that in the age group of 10 to 24, automotive deaths is the biggest killer. 
Okay? So these kids basically have survived childbirth and infant diseases, and they die in a car crash. Okay? And then if you basically look at uh, uh, old, old people, particularly old women, right? so basically the, the spouse has passed away, they're about in the mid-80s, they're living all by themselves, they're driving licenses revoked. Okay. So they basically lose independence, eventually self-esteem, I guess, right? So you can actually improve quality of living if they can still like be mobile by sitting in cars, which actually drive them uh, wherever they want to go, right? And then basically because, uh, and uh, the other aspect is that uh, most accidents happen because of, because we are humans, right? We actually we get distracted, we are moody, we are angry, uh, uh, we are uh, emotional, we are drunk, we are drowsy, we are angry, take, take your pet. Right? And I guess we need to text or we need to be on the phone. Right? We are talking to a passenger, we're dealing with a kid in the back seat. Right? If we basically put uh, the cyber aspects in there, it's monitoring. Hopefully, actually, they are always uh, aware of what is going on. Right? So that basically idea is that over time, uh, the number of deaths and uh, uh, injuries go down. So I guess many of you should know about the DARPA urban challenge that happened in uh, 2007. Uh, the idea was that vehicles that drive themselves uh, need to drive for 60 miles in less than six hours on a course where basically there are multiple autonomous vehicles running uh, with some vehicles actually driven by humans. Actually each autonomous vehicle actually had a chase vehicle driven by a human. And then uh, there was a bunch of qualifiers that happened. And the maximum speed limit was fixed by DARPA for 30 miles per hour. The idea was that these vehicles will be capable of uh, safe and defensive driving actually satisfy the California DMV rules. Uh, they need to be able to negotiate uh, uh, stationary objects, moving vehicles, uh, roadways that could be blocked, which need to be recognized in real time. There'll be intersections, there'll be round roundabouts, you need to merge. They need to be able to turn, stop, pass, merge, follow. They need to actually be able to actually do high level, almost human-like uh, reasoning. And then, of course, you need to deal with uh, curves, both paved and unpaved roads. Uh, uh, parking, which actually turns out to be actually a very difficult activity. The next time you go par to a parking lot, either to park or to unpark, not the speed at which you're driving. It actually be very low speed because it's actually a very dangerous, unstructured environment. Okay. Uh, and then, so if you have adversity, how do you make progress? So as the vehicle that we uh, fielded, uh, I guess if you look at the size of the logos, it gives you an indication of participation. Uh, <laughs> So GM was our biggest partner and sponsor. They embedded many, uh, many teams. And then the Caterpillar, they would love to automate their heavy equipment machinery. Okay. So there's a lot of incentive. Of course, uh, the military loves it, but lots of civilian applications as well. Uh, let me just uh, show a couple of uh, very quick videos to give you a sense for uh, what they were capable of. The th thing to remember is that there's nobody inside the vehicle. There's no remote control. If I told you that a human was driving it, you would not blink. You would think that it's a human driving. Okay. So it's actually a, a video documentation camera that's actually mounted inside our vehicle, and we get to see it only after the vehicle comes back. Right? Meanwhile, you're sitting there and praying uh, that it actually comes back. So it's a four-way intersection. So the, the car that comes in the, so just left. So that vehicle actually had come in uh, ahead of us, so that gets to leave. So this vehicle had uh, come there, I guess, before us, but it comes to the intersection only now, so we have the right of precedence, so we get to them. So here is a situation where we'll be coming to, uh, an, uh, to an intersection here, and when we come there, you see that that's basically a mess out there. Okay? We don't know what, right? of course, boss. our vehicle was called Boss after a GM uh, Pioneer, and it has to decide what to do. It's actually an alarm by that vehicle up there. So one vehicle is facing, facing the wrong way, I guess, in the wrong, the wrong line. We sit there, right? Nobody's moving. We humans will say, right, we, we keep moving, right? So this actually said, I need to make a left. I make a left, right? So it actually improvises, right? So, so while testing, you can imagine the number of scenarios that I have to worry about in terms of testing and coding. So, so what was the delay? Was it all compute time that it's out there trying to figure out what to do? And I guess, uh, you saw actually happening the other intersection here. I guess each vehicle takes about five seconds or so. So it's basically the delay for uh, giving them time to actually make their move. Right? In this case, actually, I'm not clear actually whether it's actually replanning. In this case, I think it was just supposed to move to the left. The it's, uh, one lane was not blocked, so it just moved. So I guess in this case, an exception scenario probably waits for 10, 15 seconds and then moves. So here is a case this actually was running. This is the uh, fastest segment on the entire course. So it's actually driving at 30 miles per hour. And you see it actually changed lanes just like a human would. Okay? It changed lanes because uh, it's actually making a left out there. It makes a left, and after you make a left, you realize that actually it's unpaved. 
and you see that basically the uh, dark shadows as well. Right? So your sensors, they have to be able to deal with that dynamic range as well. Right? So it needs to be designed. Right? So just to give you a feel for uh, what was happening then, uh, I'm going to skip over this slide. Uh, uh, I'll let me skip over this slide as well. Uh, after it came back, we actually replayed the whole sequence, the course uh, on our simulator. Ideally speaking, we could have been nine minutes faster in an almost six hour race. Okay? We are very close to actually being very good. We had obviously a couple of problems where we were not perfect. Like a far from perfect, but we did pretty well. So in terms of sensors, we had uh, lasers, radars, and cameras. It turned out that uh, lasers were the most critical, the cameras were the least critical. In terms of uh, cost, the cameras are the least expensive, and lasers are the most expensive. Right? The, iron, the sweet ironies of life, if you will. So we actually use different sensors for different things. Uh, this is actually useful to know. So we basically get raw data. Okay? We actually extract some uh, features, like for example, right angles, kind of the corners of cars, if you will. We do some measurements to basically validate this could be a car, could this be, a, for example, a lane, a road, and so on. And then we actually do some association with basically the past, Kahneman filters, if you will. Oh, I saw a vehicle before, now it probably has moved a little bit. Yes, sir? What are the smallest objects that get tracked? Like, are squirrels in real trouble when these things take to the road? Does it just get yeah. <laughs> We have to fine-tune some of those, for example, uh, during a testing phase, if it had rained the previous night and we drive, it basically hits the puddle, the water basically jumps up, it would actually think that it's a big obstacle right in front and actually you stop. <laughs> so there's a bunch of fine-tuning that you have to do. Right? So in which case, the trade-off would be the squirrel gets squashed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> As a bunch of voting happens, estimation, statistics, and so on. So at the end of the day, basically, uh, we collect all these sensor data, we fuse them together and build a real-world model on which higher layers of uh, behavioral rules and planning actually apply on top. Okay? And of course, none of this is perfect. Right? So we had a couple of situations uh, during the qualifiers and the finals where there is some noise in the sensor data. We think it's an obstacle, and we just get stuck. Right? So we knew that we are not going to be able to take care of all possible situations. Nobody can. Right? So we actually we built in some smart like, hey, if you are stuck in a particular position, right, do the following. Just try to turn this way. Try to turn that way. Maybe the world changes a bit. Doesn't change? Move back a little bit. Look at the world again. Right? Now turn again, turn again, right? And do the same thing. If not, in the worst case, back in the back up enough so you can make a U-turn and go. So we had a case where uh, there was a bug, despite all the extensive testing that we did, where a vehicle in front of us actually reached an intersection, we were behind them. The vehicle left. We still thought that the vehicle in front of us was actually just sitting there because of a, a bug, a kind of a very special case. It sat there and eventually said, I'm going to make a U-turn on a different path. Okay? So you have to be, be making continuous progress, even though you actually encounter unexpected situations. So, so, so actually, I guess uh, the, uh, uh, the punchline is that we won the race, uh, 20 minutes ahead of the second team, six teams completed. So to me, I guess the, the accomplishment was really that six teams were able to complete what I thought was a remarkably challenging race, right? kind of, to me, uh, opened up a bunch of people's eyes saying that vehicles that drive themselves is no longer science fiction. It is well within the reach uh, of, of, of us. Okay. I actually expect that in my lifetime, I am not young as Kevin pointed out, <laughs> that we will actually be able to actually have autonomous vehicles. Okay. And so, so a bunch of, so I guess given what has been done, there are, what remains, actually, so we are very closely working with uh, GM to actually do this, the bunch of challenges, uh, what I would call asogynous, basically the, uh, the challenge of dealing with the uncertainties and unpredictability of the real world. Right? You got basically have, uh, roads could be bad, you can basically have any go, there's construction happening, uh, your uh, uh, surface conditions could be bad, weather conditions can be bad, lighting conditions can be bad, how do you deal with all the real life conditions that we as humans deal with? Right? Not all of us deal with all of them well. Right? Keep that in mind. Right? So that's so the external challenges. There's a second set of challenges which is have to do with things that actually happen, go wrong inside the vehicle. Your processors can fail, your software can fail, your networks can fail, interfaces can fail. How do you deal with it? You need to obviously have replication, but you have to manage the replication, increases cost, and what is the fault model that you play with? And third category is going to happen, I guess we as humans, uh, when we drive, we do interact with other drivers on the road. Right? Uh, we use hand signals for good and bad, right? uh, so we basically let them go and so on. Right? So in the U.S., actually, the driving protocols are not that good, actually. Go to other countries, you'll see that uh, polite people let people who are driving faster go by, not in the U.S. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, uh, consumers have to accept this, both in terms of liability uh, and cost. And then lastly, of course, there are legal implications. Right? Uh, so, uh, 
uh, it's a long discussion itself. Right? So there's a bunch of challenges that need to be addressed, and I believe that this will happen sooner rather than later. And then, uh, so I guess uh, deployment has to be incremental. It cannot be overnight uh, completely. Okay. So let me, I guess, uh, so but I guess now imagine basically we had 10 dual core processors on, on our vehicle, right? And now I should be able to get basically two chips running faster, each having four cores. Now it all of a sudden is at shrank, right? But I keep, cannot keep on shrinking to a single chip because that single chip fails, all your computation platform is gone. So you need to actually be worried about, I uh, need to have really physically redundant versions as well. Right? And where do I run which is basically a very classical problem as well. So I guess uh, skipping details as a bunch of results that we've been able to do with replications and then with multi-core scheduling and so on. Okay. And, uh, so I guess, uh, so our final vision is basically to make uh, vehicles be completely autonomous, drive in all the situations that humans can. Right? People might say, can you drive in Bombay? Can you drive in, in Beijing? Hang on, guys, hang on. Right? So even I can't drive in Bombay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so meanwhile, so we expect a bunch of intermediate milestones, uh, active safety and convenience features, uh, some warnings, uh, virtual valet. That's a demo that we can do today. Not very well, but that uh, kind of the early functionality is there. We want, for example, uh, the cars to basically take over when you're, when you're on a highway. And then lastly, for example, when you're stuck in a traffic jam or on a construction zone. You're sitting there doing nothing at all. Let the car take over, right? Until the jam clears, and then you basically take control back. Right? So there's some very nice intermediate features that actually go a long way. Right? And of course, this requires that you actually have a platform that gives you a dependable, safe, embedded computing and communications, namely cyber physical systems. Right? Um, so I guess to me, a fully autonomous driving is within a grasp, and there are lots of intermediate milestones. Cooperative vehicles actually will go a long way. And then once you actually build a system like this, right, if we can actually work in an environment like highways and roads where so many things can go wrong, why not take that intelligence, the lessons that we learn, embed them into devices that actually run around at home and at offices doing things for you. It's just a lot more structured and hopefully a lot friendlier people as well. Right? So, so those things should be en enabled as well. Right? So just to quickly summarize, and I'll wrap up. I know Kevin is getting. Uh, uh, so I guess I talked about the science of cyber physical systems. Dealing with uncertainty, I think, is going to be a big, big thing. Right? So maybe you'll need to make incremental progress towards that. And there need to be abstractions, models, analysis, and synthesis techniques for integrating, composing cyber and physical components. Uh, you need to be able to deal with, uh, uh, I guess, the uh, people call it as non-functional. I like to call them as para-functional attributes for uh, timeliness, reliability, security, privacy, and safety. And then uh, there need to be a bunch of leap ahead, look ahead applications and systems uh, which have capabilities that we as technical people can agree with. And then eventually for it to be actually sold to the public, they need to be able to relate to those and benefit from those. It needs to capture the public's imagination. Okay. And of course, you need to, they need to be able to scale these uh, solutions and then uh, address it to the right segments and need to interoperate. Okay. And let me just say the future is closer than one might think. And that was our uh, finish on the autonomous race. Thanks, folks. Thanks for the opportunity and for your uh, uh, Why don't we first ask if there's any questions at any of the remote sites? Okay. So, make a move for a microphone. So, uh, why don't we open up for questions? And if anyone at the remote sites wants to jump in, feel free to do so at any time. So, we'll open one. So I have a comment and a question. The comment was you were talking about the power supply early on. My parents have actually for 30 years had two power meters running into the house so that they most of the power is on the cheap meter that turns off during peak hours. So taking a shower at the wrong time of day is really a surprise in their house. <laughs> um, the second was a comment I've seen some ads recently talking about cars that break automatically. Is that a follow-out of this kind of work, or is that a different uh, line altogether? So, so going back to the first comment, uh, absolutely true, right? So you can basically say lots of things existed. Okay? So the analogy that I would make is the following. So, so go back, to, I guess, to the late 60s, early 70s, when DARPA funded this uh, silly project called the ARPANET where some universities were trying to send a few bytes of information between two you know, campuses. Right? They could have basically just picked up a phone and have a real live rich audio conversation. Right? So I guess uh, right, So it was those beginnings, if you will, that actually led to the revolution of the internet. So while these 
point solutions have existed, the goal is how do we actually make them be scalable and widely applicable with standards in place. Right? So having that, both the intellectual infrastructure and the physical infrastructure in place that actually gets adopted on a wide basis. And once we deploy that, it's just not going to be just for electricity monitoring and control, but I can piggyback things like water, gas, and everything else. So, it's this. so I guess so going back to the second one, uh, so I don't think you can actually relate some of these automatic braking uh, to the systems uh, that I'm talking about here. Uh, the automotive industry, it turns out, it actually is very aggressive. Based on what has happened in the recent economic conditions and so on, people have the wrong mindset that these are very lethargic, old style, bureaucratic companies. That not the case, actually. They are actually in a very competitive segment. And each car today, for example, has 30, 40 microcontrollers. They are constantly looking at new sensors, new actuators, and computing platforms that go in. As part of that, lots and lots of smarts exist in today's cars. Right? So this is basically, again, taking it kind of two planes above. Okay. So I wonder if you can speak to what the expected time window for backwards compatibility for all these sensors and actuators are going to be? I mean, like, like you said, there's going to be a trillion points of, of a potential sensors, right? And every time we build a new building, oh, OK, great. Let's, let's put them all in there, right? But then, then we get better sensors. And now we have buildings that have been built with the old sensors, and now new buildings that have been built with the new sensors, right? And so eventually, especially with physical systems, because physical things kind of stick around for long periods of time, how does that impact you know, this idea that even as the technology gets better, there's going to be this long window of backwards compatibility or being able to deal with you know, iteration after iteration of the technology that's going to live in the physical system for lot, you know, at time scales that are much longer than the innovation cycle. So I guess uh, the uh, telephone wiring, if you will, uh, it's actually uh, comes with these two lines coming in for, for, for a long, long time. If you look at the electrical plug design, I've been seeing that since the days of Edison, perhaps, maybe a few years after that. Right? So, so these things uh, have a tendency to stick around. So I guess the, uh, the selling argument that I make for the device that I showed was that because it is wireless, you just basically make it uh, compact enough that it actually fits inside your switch plate behind the face plate of your switches and your plug points. So it actually kind of becomes invisible, works with your existing buildings. Because for the new buildings, you can make the argument that instead of having this wireless uh, fabric for communications, I can wire it, right? which is still very costly. Right? So yes, you're completely, uh, so this is basically, hey, put this in, and over time I can actually imagine that there will be newer versions of that technology as well, but they will be forced to be backward compatible with the wireless radio protocols that these guys use. Yeah. Comment. When the Bell system had the monopoly on telephony, the basic company policy was that anything new had to, be, had to work with anything up to 40 years old, but not anything earlier. And so everything, I spent one summer in a lab working on a new dialing scheme and testing it against uh, everything back for 40 years. <laughs> so for example, going back to, I guess, the water case, uh, right? I guess you don't have the problem in North Carolina, but uh, where I live and even further north, a frequent problem is uh, in winter, a pipe freezes, the pipe bursts, basically the whole building can actually uh, can, uh, get uh, damaged. Right? Why not have a sensor that I can remotely monitor? And basically, if that's that uh, uh, level is sensed, it automatically turns on the supply, sends me an email, right? So, and multiply that by the number of points that of, of control and usage. Right, but does that affect protocol design? Because, like, like Fred said, right? If I know that anything new is going to have to be backwards compatible for 40 years, then anything new I invent, I have to say, okay, this is, you know, everybody else is going to be forced to be backwards compatible to this. That might affect the, the, the design principles uh -huh. by which we build these things. Sure. So, so to me, I guess uh, I would take the Microsoft model here. So whoever goes in there and becomes the dominant vendor gets to set the standards that everybody else becomes asked to be compatible. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> would you pick someone else? <laughs> So, so, so clearly, uh, lots of uh, issues for network uh, protocols, right? Mm -hmm. Sanjay. So, um, you didn't mention anything about privacy and civil liberties and the like. I mean, I, I would be worried about you know, this pervasive, uh, you know, prevalence of sensors. So, 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 so privacy concerns actually are, are humongous. Uh, for the electricity monitoring, 
if your utility company knows exactly what is being turned on, they can pretty much uh, infer exactly what is happening in your household, right? Uh, giving today can basically look at your package and tell you what the heck is going on, what applications you're running. Uh, so I guess I have uh, two answers. The one answer basically says, our generation tends to be paranoid, right? And we need to kind of anonymize some of this data, put in some strict rules uh, wherever applicable. And the other argument basically is that we, the new generation is a Facebook generation, and they don't give a damn about privacy apparently. Okay. So, <laughs> if you have any doubt, so you should say uh, the Facebook generation is kind of a silly generation, you may be right. Go look at this site called mint.com, where you can basically upload all your financial information, including your bank account information, all your credit card information, and people do this routinely for free. It's like basically giving those guys all your financial information and say, please steal my identity. <laughs> okay. and 1.5 million people are subscribers. So I guess all I'm saying is that uh, I would not be overly concerned about privacy. So go back, I guess, uh, how many years now? Five years now, right? Apparently, telephone calls, email messages, internet communication were all being tapped by you, you know who. Who cared? I do care. Right? <laughs> you do. You did. Right? But the, but the people at large did not. Right? So basically, so the minority lives with whatever the majority decides. Right? <laughs> I, I get the mind. I un so I understand. So I guess I'm not a privacy expert. I guess they will give you a very different answer. So I guess uh, uh, security I'm really, really worried about. Okay? So privacy I think we'll deal with it just like as uh, society evolves, we'll live with it. For example, right? So for example, take your car. That's a license plate. Right? Just by tracking a license plate wherever it goes, because pretty much lots and lots of intersections in Europe, and I guess happening in the US as well, they can look at your license plate and exactly know who you are. Right? So lots and lots of things happening around us. Right? I am not going to be able to uh, predict what is going to happen, what you're about there today. I just do my part, and then others have to step in and basically do their part. Yes, sir. Jack? Yeah. I was wondering already if you, with the building uh, monitoring applications that you have, I mean, the, the screens you were showing were very detailed views. How do you get a global picture of all of these things that are being monitored all at once? So I guess uh, we actually have uh, two models that we can actually currently do. I, we do a demo of that. One demo basically is that you buy these nodes and then deploy it in your house. And you basically, uh, they talk to an access point that you also install as a client to your uh, router. And then you basically just like you do the uh, uh, 192.168.1.1. .1, and you can basically look, visualize what is deployed in your environment. You can control them, set thermostats to turn them on off automatically, put some rules, uh, some intelligence, learning, and so on. Right? That's model one, where you control your environment. The second model is the mint.com model where every customer exports all their information to a central entity somewhere, and they in turn can delete the identity specific information, but they can aggregate all the information about everybody, all the customers, and now they can basically show a distribution of this is the usage of this brand of customers. You are out here on the right or on the left, so that is you can compare where you fall Right? And over time, basically, people understand which actor gives you the best bang for the buck, and everybody basically starts moving towards the average. I like can lake work begin, everybody's better than average. Right? And lo and behold, the peak consumption has come down. So I think both models are feasible. What happens in practice remains to be seen. Question from NC State. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, you, um, earlier you talked about ruling out the singularity. But I was wondering if you were concerned with the security of having control systems networked and having them invaded either by computer intelligence or human intelligence and, and hacked, if you will, and what level of security is actually being addressed in these systems? So that's a, that's a great question. So I guess more than the privacy question, this is the question that I, I, I really worry about. Because these things will be controlling uh, electricity, which actually drives lots of things, uh, water and gas, all of which can cause uh, damage. Right? So I think the solution is yet to be undefined. So the way I look at it is that this is a very fertile domain for people to bring in. I guess your mic uh, just left. right? So imagine basically the mic writers of the world working with the real-time embedded systems of the world, not unlike yourself, coming up with a joint solution that actually works for this domain. Right? So I guess I can imagine multiple things. As just an example, at each of these sensing actuation points, 
that is quote unquote a processor where we can embed some intelligence right so that intelligence basically kind of understands what that device is supposed to do its role and responsibility right and then if anything such seems to violate that quote unquote uh, intent or contract happens it understands that locally and does something i guess it does its part and then some of the composition of all the parts when they actually rea detect and react to that some good emergent property happens so this is a strictly a conjecture on my part this may be impossible but the goal basically is that the same smarts that made you a possible attack victim is also the defense right so let me again give you one thought uh, to understand what uh, security really means so we I, i don't think we should be overly paranoid as well for example today in quote unquote the dumb grid that we have if there is an outage for example a tree fell on wires and there's outage in the neighborhood apparently more utilities you know how they actually find out that an outage has happened they basically phone calls start coming in saying that there's no electricity in my home and they basically locate uh, the uh, houses of those uh, cars and say ah we are getting it from so the electricity outage must be in that so they actually triangulate based on the sources of the calls so that's how bad it is right so i guess i like to say this to some of my students when you have these philosophical discussions technology was is and will be a two edged sword okay there will be good sides there will be negative sides right so we need to be cognizant of both right remember for example the autonomous driving part i see lots and lots of uh, civilian discussions but the whole thing was funded by darpa with the d in front right so i guess uh, it's i leave it to philosophers to basically philosophize about should be tech, should technology be making progress or ne- not making progress right so when these systems get deployed expect some bad things to happen but in the final analysis i hope that the net benefit of society would be positive okay any other questions for raj thank you again thanks